Hello, my name is Taya Graham, and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I never get tired of saying, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we examine the system that makes bad policing possible. And today, we're going to achieve that goal by examining how a powerful police agency has turned a life-saving service into a military-style surveillance program. It's a telling example of how the constant expansion of law enforcement can have unforeseen consequences. But before I get started, a reminder that viewer support is absolutely crucial to the Police Accountability Report. If you can, please go to therealnews.com forward slash donate and become a monthly sustainer for as little as $5 a month. We can't do this type of work without you, so please help out if you can. Now, as you may or may not know, the Police Accountability Report is produced in Baltimore City. It's the headquarters of The Real News, and it's where both Stephen and I both got our start as reporters covering policing, crime, poverty, and governance. And as we reported before, our hometown law enforcement agency is a fountain of corruption and malfeasance. For years, the city practiced a howling form of zero tolerance policing, which led to 100,000 arrests per year in a city with a population of roughly 600,000. Without accounting for multiple arrests of the same person, that's roughly one in six people being arrested for almost 10 years. We are also home to the notorious Gun Trace Task Force, a group of roughly nine Baltimore City officers who robbed residents, dealt drugs, and stole overtime. But there's another lesson to be learned from Baltimore's ongoing problem with bad policing. And that is, to a certain extent, policing in our city actually contributes to the chaos it purports to fix. In other words, as we have continued to throw money at cops to staunch a stubbornly high crime rate, the tendrils of law enforcement have changed everything it touches. And that's why today we're going to focus on one intriguing example of what happens when policing becomes the solution for everything. Particularly when a town beset by crime allows law enforcement to infiltrate institutions that previously remained outside its purview. In this case, I'm talking about a life-saving tool known as medevac helicopters, air ambulances that transport patients from accidents or rural locations to receive life-saving emergency care that would otherwise be inaccessible in most states. Medevacs are operated by private companies or hospitals. In other words, generally speaking, air ambulances are part of our existing healthcare infrastructure. Now, setting aside the problems with our beleaguered healthcare system for a moment, it's how medevacs are operated here in Maryland that came to our attention this week because of some internal documents we obtained. And what the data in this internal report reveals is the blueprint for how over-reliance on law enforcement can lead to unintended and troubling consequences. That's because in our state, the medevac system is essentially controlled by the Maryland State Police. This means that cops, not doctors or aviation experts, manage the system. And that arrangement led to a very controversial and consequential decision that is just bearing fruit now. Nearly a decade ago, the state was seeking to replace the medevac helicopters that had been in use for roughly 20 years. The aircraft had aged, and the agency had experienced a tragic accident in 2008 that killed a pilot, a nurse, and a patient. Advocates who scrutinized the state's emergency medical system were shocked. Let's listen to aviation watchdog Dick Johnson explain. My first reaction is, why are they buying a, a tactical military helicopter that's unproven. It's been plagued with mechanical and instrumentations. That's because the choice made by the Maryland State Police was odd. Instead of picking some of the more commonly used types of aircraft, they selected a military aircraft known as an AW-139. Now, for those of you who don't know, the AW-139 is a huge, cumbersome helicopter fully equipped for military-type missions. It's far from a prototype that can be easily adapted to medical emergencies. Let's listen. No, it's a multi-mission helicopter, and it's more designed for tactical purposes. If you look at the aircraft itself, it has repellent bars to repel seven troopers to the ground. They have a tactical suite inside the aircraft. It's more geared towards war. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's war on who? That was my first reaction when I heard that 
they decided to go with the 139. And unlike cheaper, less complex aircraft used for medical transport, AW-139s are costly. The AW-139s were not only much more expensive than the previous fleet, but the requirements to operate and maintain them meant that the cost to taxpayers to operate medevac fleets skyrocketed. Which brings me to the documents we obtained from the state, which reveal how the dual purpose of these massive machines have led to a troubling strategy for deploying them in Baltimore City. And it's not for life-saving medical transport. For more on what's going on, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Taya. So Stephen, what have you learned about the use of these helicopters in Baltimore? Because it's far from medevac, right? Well, we obtained internal documents from the Maryland State Police that show they've been flying 400 missions over the city of Baltimore. And so we pursued and we asked the Maryland State Police, what's been going on? How many missions have you actually flown and how much have they cost? And they got back to us and said they have spent a million, half a million dollars flying surveillance over Baltimore City. What's really interesting about what they said is they said these were medevac missions first, and then after they delivered patients, they flew over the city, which really doesn't make any sense because these machines can only fly for like 40 minutes without being refueled. So none of it really makes any sense, but this is something that really calls into question what they're doing with these helicopters. Are they medevacs or are they surveillance? Now, the city already tried this with a so-called spy plane. What was it and what were the results? Well, like many cities that have crime problems and also over-policing, this city is surveilled to absurdity. For a while, we had a secret spy plane that no one knew about flying over the city, filming people 12 hours a day. That was eventually abandoned because it was found to be ineffective and also because people really didn't like the fact that it was secret. So this is just another fat phase of this sort of omni-surveillance that Baltimore City seems to think will solve crime, not like addressing poverty. Stephen, you did an extensive investigation into the purchase of these helicopters. Why do you think the state bought military aircraft for medical missions? Why is it a problem they're being used by local police? Well, what we're seeing with these helicopters, these AW-139s, is exactly what we're seeing in policing across the country. That is militarization of policing. Unfortunately, the police had actually taken over the medevac system and turned it into a military operation. And this is the problem with policing infiltrating institutions that are supposed to help the public and, and lead to public safety and or actually help. In this case, they taken something that should be an instrument of health and turn it into a military surveillance tool. So it's absurd. Now, it's worth noting that if there is anything Baltimore has an abundance of, it's policing. Beyond the roughly half a billion dollars the city spends annually on cops alone, almost every federal law enforcement agency has a huge footprint in our otherwise neglected hometown. In fact, last year, we reported on plans to build a massive federal office space in Southwest Baltimore to house a federal drug task force. In 70,000 square feet of office space to the tune of $2.3 million a year. But let's contrast that investment to this story in the Washington Post, because while the city is overrun with cops and prisoners, one thing residents don't have access to is vaccines. The story recounted how hundreds of millions of doses of life-saving vaccines were being manufactured in a plant in East Baltimore while city residents were finding it difficult to get access to their own shots. According to the article, just 5% of Baltimore residents had received a shot, compared to a national average of roughly 10%. It's a stark contrast. Tons of cash for law enforcement, jails and punishment, and relatively limited access to life-saving medicine made by the city residents who can't get it. But this lack of proportion between communal health and our overemphasis on cops is not limited to Baltimore. Instead, it's simply part of a pattern that can be found throughout the country, firmly dedicated to badges and guns and less enthusiastic about healing and progress. Consider this, more people in our country have criminal records than college degrees. That's right, according to the Brennan Center for Justice, there are more U.S. citizens entangled in our criminal justice system than have graduated from an institution of higher learning. Just for the record, PolitiFact calculated that 70 million people in the U.S. have some sort of criminal record. Think about what that means, what it says about the broader systemic issues we're always referencing on the show. Imagine the U.S. as a sort of factory, a giant processor of people's lives. Ideally, it's an educator and employer. 
a health provider and protector of freedom. What does this startling statistic imply about how we actually shape people's lives? What does the social factory we've constructed around punishment and policing mean? Well, I think it speaks volumes, not just about the fact that we're better at turning people into criminals than scholars, but something deeper, a communal state of mind that elicits a troubling malaise that engulfs us all. What I'm saying here is that the U.S. is in some sense a carceral state, a literal internment camp for both the mind and body, a country that imprisons for profit and in doing so has consigned a broad swath of its population to subsist without a fighting chance at prosperity. I mean, how does a nation which bestows more probation and punishment than education and enlightenment expect to succeed? How can the pursuit of happiness, a notion enshrined in our founding principles, result in more people being locked in a cage or shackled by limited opportunity. What I'm trying to say is that this tale of two helicopters speaks volumes about the consequences of expanding policing into aspects of our lives where it seemingly doesn't belong. That allowing law enforcement to infiltrate further into governance and health can turn these two processes into instruments of restraint and suffering. Not only is this a sort of mission creep that creates bad public policy, it's also the evolution of the psychology of punishment that has defined every core of our civic lives. That's why on this show we try to expose how policing turns life-saving helicopters into instruments of surveillance. And that's why we will continue to search for troubling examples of law enforcement overreach whenever and wherever we can find them. I'd like to thank my guest, Dick Johnson, for presenting his research for us. Thank you so much. And I would have to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, editing, and research on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And of course, I'd like to thank friend of the show, Noli D. Thanks, Noli D. Also, if you're interested, there's an excellent book our own editor Brandon Soderberg wrote called I Got a Monster, which gives an excellent accounting of just how corrupt the GTTF really was. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate for you. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com or you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And of course, we have the Police Accountability Report Facebook page and Instagram page and you can reach us on Twitter at Eyes on Police. And please share, like, and comment on our videos. You know I read your comments and that I appreciate them. My name is Taya Graham, and I'm your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please, be safe out there.